So what I want to do today is and discuss some of the things that we have on the board, and if we don't get to them, we'll try to get to them next, on next Tuesday, is I want to look at the ed medic medicine and education, being black and poor in America in, in the 1980s, the CDC report. Know this, learn this, understand it, because you're going to see it again. Okay. We're talking about a high infant on mortality, low level of education. Okay, we're looking at low income, poor neighborhood, a depressed neighborhood. A lot of these neighborhoods don't even have grocery, grocers. They call them food deserts. There are two cities I'm gonna mention that are that if the national chains, Meyer, which is back east, Kroger, which is our sister store, Ralph's, and Fries. Albertson's regional, Safeway is regional. Detroit, Michigan, and Columbus, Ohio. The local grocers used to be Big Bear, Columbus, Ohio, and in Detroit it was Farmer Jack's. If those national stores that I mentioned previously left, what would people in Detroit and Columbus get their food? We have to understand. All of this is connected because we talk about the health, okay? You can add um, poor quality of food. But this one here, high contact with the law, law enforcement. You close recreation centers, you close treatment centers for people that are addicted to a new drug. We're talking about cocaine, but you can smoke it, because normally you would snort cocaine and you put it in rock form. Rock form. It was so bad the cats that I went to school with, and I share this story quite often, that I'm sitting up here making lamps for my mom, and they over there making pipes. And the pipes were designed well. They had all these different designs in the pipes, different grooves and everything. And then they put their glass beaker on the top of the pipe, he said, I mean, you smoke it, I guess it won't come out. So, low plans to marry. When you're thinking about getting high, you ain't thinking about marrying nobody. And one thing about crack cocaine, it was one of those quick fixes. You start a line of coke, it lasts you for a while. That's going how you know. Were you doing it? No, I wasn't doing it. But I've seen enough people, besides, a lot of people, and I'm not going to mention no names because I don't do that. But some of these people are uh, known nationally. <laughs> they were doing it. But they knew that I wouldn't tell their business. High unemployment. <coughs> unemployment. Now, was this drug use in the 1980s, was this heavy? Was this in all sections of society? You better believe it. That's why I wrote this up on the board. NBA, NFL, and I wrote particular years. Well, don't they have drug testing in the military? Sure they do. You think drug testing gonna stop people from smoking weed? Or doing cocaine? In fact, that might do it, uh, enhance it. Let me see if I can beat the system. We talk about this here, the NBA, in 1986-87. What happened in those years in the NBA? Well, I asked somebody to look up. She's not here. She's on a business trip. LB. Yeah, 1986. June 19, 1986, that was a Thursday. Changed the course of history. No, um, from the Cleveland Browns. Reggie, Reggie Lewis went to 93. Okay. We're talking about the 80s. You see, nobody was dying of cocaine. And what's interesting, folks, is when you mention Lynn Bias, why don't you tell the truth for those of us that were around in the 80s? Because, see, you still don't tell the truth. We're talking about people going to prison for crack cocaine. You can't have crack cocaine without the coke, without the powder. L.B. and them, Lynn Bias and them were doing cocaine. 
Now, I ask this question for people who are around, who people who think they know. Where did his death occur? They say the University of Maryland, which he did, in the dorm room. What was he doing in the dorm room? Nobody knows. I know. He was in summer school. He was 20 credits shy to get his degree. Because even though he was doing the cocaine, and he was celebrating, because that's how people celebrated. That's how people celebrated, folks. His contract, he had just signed a contract with Reebok. And the idea of it is when he flew to Boston, he had a, a round trip ticket. And the ticket fell out of his pocket. His mom had a premonition. that something was going to happen to her son. And I always kept wondering, why is it that this cat, why do I always talk about it? Why is this still with me 31 years later? And come to find out that he's born on the same day as my mother. Come to find out that the day he died was my cousin's birthday. And she said she'll never, never forget her 23rd birthday. I hate the Celtics. That's who was drafted. I'm a Laker fan. And I remember when he was drafted, I said, I might, I might have to change my allegiance to the Celtics. Now that's deep. That, that's heavy. I'm not going to lie to you. That's what I said. But you know something? That's treasonous. That's treasonous. That is treasonous, folks. That is true. That is treasonous. But about. And they got to pick number 10 in the 86 draft, and as I'm sitting there with my boys and stuff, I start having this, these thoughts. I said, I, they asked me, they said, what's wrong with you? I said, I, I don't like the Celtics pick. They said, man, it's your boy. I said, it's something, I just don't, I'm not feeling this, man. 48 hours later, one of them came and got me. Wouldn't tell me what was going on. They said, come down to the room and come down to the room, and then that's when we got the news. They had already knew they wouldn't tell me. Because I couldn't believe it. And I'm still in shock 31 years later. Because see, that's something you don't get over. Don Rogers, who you were talking about, died eight days later in 86. 87 in the NBA, we had, it was supposed to be a federal drug trial. And the guy who was the star witness got the car accident and was killed. His name was Johnny Hopkins. We brought down a lot of big leaders in the NBA. 1985. You know, for about the dark. 1985. Allegheny Courthouse. Baseball. Them guys were sitting up here doing cocaine in the clubhouse, in the dugout. The 86 Mets team. Full of drug addicts. Straw Perry, good. The good king couldn't even get up for the uh, parade. But you were going to say something? Oh, that's right okay. <laughs> so, this permeated throughout society. And any young person at that time, the older heads always assume that every young person did drugs. And if you didn't do drugs, they didn't want you around them people that did drugs. How you going to escape it? If you were in any form of entertainment, it was going to be right. You didn't have to do it, but it was there. And what's interesting about the 80s, nobody fooled nobody. And if you didn't do it, they figured you were 5 old. They said, he got to be 5 old. He don't smoke weed. He don't do drugs. He from Chicago. That don't know. Something ain't right. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a, uh, a lot of times if you watch the movie New Jack City, the Wesley Snipes, he got that big hoop earrings. Mm -hmm. He need no rhyme. <laughs> All right. His career took off. You watch Samuel Samuel Jackson, big big star. Okay, he box office now, but he played Jungle Fever. He was um, Gator and Jungle Fever. Yeah. Crackhead. Crackhead. He was in rehab 
where the movie was being made. He told Spike Lee, Spike, you know I'm in rehab. This is a perfect role for you. Yeah. Hey. I took a pinch, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the TV. <laughs> he played that role, and that's what was going on, folks. People were still in what, aluminum sign off people's houses just to turn it in for aluminum so they get money to buy dope. This was real. But see, people that were around that time, they don't tell me that stuff. They hold me the now. They're Republicans. They're conservative. They wear suits every day. And they talk about how bad you people are, the millennials. They don't want to tell you those stories, what they were doing. They were on the table. <laughs> exactly. I'm telling you, I know. Okay? That's why I never pass judgment on you guys. I don't mind saying it either. I don't care if it's on tape, but I'm just telling you. <laughs> so structural and economic um, inequality. We got centuries of Jim Crowism, Jim Crow Esquire. You got the guy who now is a racist and he wears dockers and polo shirts. He don't wear hoods anymore. That's played out, as Curtis Blow would say. They don't wear the hoods and the robes that come at night. They wear the black robes, and they wear badges, and they pass bills, and they wear suits, and they talk about we're doing everything for the American people. <laughs> and you think these people are nice people. You heard Dr. Carl. See, we ain't supposed to talk about the 1980s. Comparison. Everybody's concerned about the opioids. You should be. But let me go back in time because some of us don't have revisionist history. We deal with facts. And we deal with what happened. In certain states in this country, they were trying to close colleges while they were building more prisons. They stopped building prisons like the colleges. So they had the Constantine wire, they call it barbed wire. But this is what happened in the 80s. You see it. Okay, and we're still dealing with that impact. That's why when you mention certain individuals' names from the 80s, the, the language that comes out the mouths of people who were around. I'm a kid. What do I know? I knew a lot because the older heads used to talk to me and tell me what was going on. And I never knew that I would use those conversations as lecture material. Did I know? But I'm glad I did one thing is listen to them. But they talked to me because they respected my intelligence, even at that young age. Okay. And this is a continuum, um, because we're going back and forth to age, because like, like I mentioned to you, that a lot of these individuals, a lot of these chapters are married to each other. Okay. And I just want you to um, just, just relax, give your hands a break on this here. Okay, give your hands a break, just tell them yellow, yellow fever. Um, many people in the medical field feel that um, blacks have, a, um, can take pain. You know, we get we we have pain threshold just like anybody else. Okay. But I want to get to something, so just bear with me, folks. Now, I want to ask a question. Because you hear about the Tuskegee experiment. B double? You should know. I'm looking at y'all, B double sitting over here. He don't have his hat on today, but I'm looking at him. B double? How long did the Tuskegee <laughs> experiment? Last be double? Come on, be double. Come on, you got a new haircut. You can think. Thank you. <laughs> Come on, be double. <laughs> Your haircut's nice, that's what I was trying to say. You don't know, have your hat on. I mean, 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 Help be dug well. How long did Tuskegee's experiment last? I'm not Take a guess. Um, you want to pass it up? Uh, I guess seven, eight years. Logan? Dr. Black. Ms. Lawrence? 
But now, now, there's some things when we deal with race that have transferred through the centuries. However, Tuskegee experiment lasted 40 years. 40. From, from the 1930s to the 1970s. 32 to 70. Only 10 years of Okay. So we think about this, folks. Infecting men. That's what we have to understand. That's why a lot of people, if they don't know, they don't understand why black men do not want to go to the doctor. It's from the scene. It was a doctor in Michigan. He just got prosecuted. Miles, I don't know if you're familiar with this story outside of Michigan, outside of Detroit, where this doctor was practicing and he was um, giving people fake medicine for years. He finally got prosecuted. There was another one in Pennsylvania. I'm going to go to the doctor. A lot of it they bring up because of Tuskegee. Okay, a lot of people believe in natural forms of um, medicine because of what happened in Tuskegee. And you'll see why, because there was another Tuskegee. But don't, don't worry about that, there was another Tuskegee. Okay. We talk about black pregnant women in, in, in um, 97. We're talking about 20 years ago in Kenya. Put this in your notes. Okay, this is another reason. Because the respect, the whole thing with placebo instead of real medicine because they felt that they weren't working. What is wrong here, folks? How can you practice this called well medic medicine and be prejudiced? You already think that they're not human? You don't, you don't respect them. Yeah. Not human. We, we don't respect you. We don't provide, we're not going to provide quality truth because of what you are. Well, what they've you? been doing this since then. Yeah, well, you know, um, I cannot argue with Moe's assessment, you know, but I was being specific, Moe. But for the, the idea that she would come up with the number 100 years, it might not be 100 in reference to Tuskegee, but the mindset we call, is there, the test, these individuals, we're going to test and see. Ms. Voss, you going into medicine? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> All right. We're going to test on this group of individuals and see how they react. That'll let us know. Research experiment. Okay. You get that in the first ten years? <laughs> you yeah, well, if you think back to that time, we're talking about nineteen thirty two. That was not positive at all, time period. So let's look at this. They believe this was justified. The whole thing is we, it's justified. One, because women gave informal consent. How can you give informal consent? Thank you. Two, research, Miss Lawrence, is beneficial. It's beneficial for research. If they don't know, they don't need to know. Research is beneficial. It's about research. Okay? They can't afford it. Number three, thus they aren't worse off receiving a fake medication or medicine. And then the whole thing about studies are necessary to find affordable treatments. So they can't afford it. Research is beneficial. This is how we justify it. So when they're asked, justification. They don't matter. What's that thing you said, um, Ms. Caldwell? They don't, they're less than human. That means it's justifiable. Well, it was nice. But this, one, this is what occurred in the 1980s. 
this is 97, for medicine, medicine and, and education. But the whole thing, folks, this is something that we have to deal with. We have to discuss this. You ever go to the doctor and ask him, okay, what are you doing now? See, a good doctor will explain to you what they're about to do, what type of medication, what is it for, how is it going to benefit you. When they can't explain, it's a whole, whoa, what you doing? My wife had to sell me, you know, they got to put the IV in your, in your arm. I said, why? I don't, you know, I don't like stuff in my body before a certain time. Yeah, but you know, you have to, if she wouldn't have been there, it wouldn't have happened. Whole thing about medication because I think about medication, I think it's dope. But understand that people need it. It's not me. So, and you asked Ms. Lawrence, informal? Yeah. B double, you got something? Yeah, I was about to say another reason why most blacks don't like going to the hospitals also, and this is never talked about, but uh, 40. Or yeah. yeah, yeah, that's one that, um, if, if you look up, there's a gentleman that was killed back in 2013 or 14. In the gym? Like, yes, oh, yes, oh, thanks, Ms. Lowell. Yeah. yeah, named Kendrick Johnson. Oh, there's another guy, too. They found they they his death accident. Yeah, that's him. Yeah. And that whole thing about organ, um, organ still. And just think, I just put that in perspective, folks. Your organs, man. Did they ever find out how he died? No. They ruled the the state or whatever. They ruled it accidental, accidental. and yeah. then their family uh, hired a new one. Yeah. It was like it's clearly homicide. Yeah. Was inside they're gone. Yeah. With newspaper stuffed in. Mm -hmm. Newspaper. How that? Yes, newspaper stuffed in his body. Yeah. Yes. Newspaper stuff in his body. Yeah. But see. Say <laughs> <laughs> <So> what? Say <laughs> <So> what? <laughs> okay. We talk about Howard University. Everybody familiar with Howard University is? It's in Washington, D.C. Um, when we think about Howard University, um, 1868, um, built in Washington, D.C. It's called Howard University Hospital. And it was a school for mulattoes, mixed race um, individuals, and the offspring of the whites. It was one of the schools that um, did not, uh, only black college to receive full uh, federal funding. That's interesting, and then um, how does anybody know? Because uh, this is tied in too. <coughs> Former FBI director James Coleman went to Howard University about a month ago. Mm -hmm. What type of reception did he get? He was booed. <laughs> he booed off the stage. Now we connect the dots and wonder why this guy was moved off the stage when he was fired by the 45th president. But see, it's the agency he worked for that was the issue. Now, what is his connection with um, the 1980s and law enforcement, going back, back and forth, the whole thing with um, treatment centers, law enforcement, thus you have sentence, thus you're on parole, it, once you get out, you're on some form of supervision. You'll hear people tell you that the prison system is um, the numbers in prison, people in prison has declined. What they're not telling you is the people that are on supervision. That's the problem. You know, we discussed Dr. Angela Davis um, before the midterm. She has always been on the forefront of um, the, the whole thing with the prison system. 
have you noticed around with schools and why schools are important with the prison system because we talk about the prison pipeline. Dr. Michelle Alexander in her book, New Jim Crow, has been talking about this for a while, where you see more um, police officers in the schools. How they're arresting five-year-olds, putting the cuffs on them. Yes. Where is the adults to the point where you have to go and get the cops? Cheyenne? One of those videos putting uh, handcuffs on a little kid, he had autism. Yes, he yeah. was, in Kentucky. Uh -huh. And in fact, they had to put the handcuffs on his elbow. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. two, it was two kids. It was two. Little girl, too. Yeah. So we have to ask ourselves, folks, what is going on? Okay. What were they arresting the kids for? They were unruly in the classroom. They were acting, yeah, they were acting out. Acting out. Like, but, 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 I'm being bad. Yeah, but the question you should ask yourself is this. Where are the adults? Why do you have to call the police? When you can call their parents, you call can call parents. somebody that belongs to that child. Right. You but know, but as a, I feel like as a teacher... I, 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 I remember growing up, if anybody acted out anywhere, the first person you saw was your parent. You oh, yes. saw your parent before you saw any, I mean, or hey, I was there. I was there. I got in trouble in junior high. My parents were right there. As a teacher, of, you, I mean, you have to have a separate license to teach autism. <laughs> and so as a teacher of, a, of like students of autism, autism, there should be some type of a, protocol you have to uh, we're usually like, there are you saying that, that, that there, it's all right for what they did oh no oh, of no. course no definitely not i'm saying they keep they, they should know how to handle the situation if they're out of control and, and as they're five so years old where they got to bring a, a law enforcement no, no. They, they shouldn't be able they should be trained, should be trained to already okay. have that situation yeah, handled how, without how being in it okay. yeah, 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 yeah. think about think about teachers in general that are not getting paid enough to be taught to do that but you know then you get they're not getting paid to get hold on wait 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 a minute 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 okay get one at a time this is a very very sensitive subject okay no who was oh go ahead okay so Going off what you were saying, my mom works with uh, people with special needs, and she was working in the schools. And and sometimes there are situations where you need to bring law enforcement in because there's not a safe way to have these kids under control. Like to detain these kids, like so. So it's just like if you don't want to put your safety at risk. You don't put your safety at risk. Hold on. Wow. Other, students, other, students, other students. Other students. Wait a minute. You're not just thinking He's about telling it. the truth. They, they, it's, yeah. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Continue. Go ahead, Mr. Williams. Oh, I was just saying that it's the other students' well-being plus yourself. And when like people with special needs get in, like, how like an like aggressive, start acting yeah. aggressively, yeah. they don't. I mean, the team, yeah. like, they don't know how to like behavior? truly. Is that yeah. behavior? It is it's behavior. Okay. Because I mean, when you get out of control, like there's really not a safe way. There sometimes is, but sometimes there's not. To I have that. a son that's autistic and he has Asperger's, and I felt that when he had issues as far as in school, the teachers passed his book instead of when you want to do the job instead of assessing the situation honestly. Mm -hmm. so, exactly. but, so I, I get what you're saying to what he said, but I, it's a grain of salt. But, but I feel like it's a difference between like what the cops did okay. was unnecessary, putting him in handcuffs oh, right. above, the, above the elbow. That's the point of unnecessary like it was that's yeah, the too much. Talk to because I mean there's a, there's there's levels of there's levels of like uh, uh I don't know the word. There's levels of of situations to where, right. like, the kid's five years old. He should never be in handcuffs right. before the age of 13, right. honestly. But what? There's a difference. You should be. A, you should not never put a kid in handcuffs before the age of a, of a teenager. Should never be in handcuffs. At five years old, get on.
autism, that's another level of dis of yeah, you're out there, like, you're out there. Yeah, but I mean, at, at 12 years old, you know, we just put a kid in the That's what we did. Okay. If a 12 year old going out shooting people, of course we'll put him in the hand. Oh, yeah, but, but yeah, we just say, you know what? But if you think of a 12 year old, 12 year olds don't get tried as 18 year olds when they kill people. They don't. Okay. They do. They do. Okay. They they do. Not all the time. They do. 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 There are younger offenders, younger than the age of 13, who have killed other children who are currently serving life sentences yes. today, exactly. since at prison. the age of 7, 8, 9. Exactly. Um, so that's not But five? Sure. It should be in handcuffs? You're yeah. telling me a five-year-old should, there's a liable reason that for a five-year-old with autism with, to be in handcuffs? <laughs> He did have autism. He did have autism. Yeah, he did. Both of them did. It was a classroom full of autism. And, 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 I think he just said autism. Kid, I meant to say kids with autism, yeah. children with autism. Okay. See. So there's, there's a difference right there when you got. But see, this goes back to the 1980s. And I mentioned two things that were cut education. Education and recreation. And you guys are highlighting that because when you cut education, then you had truant officers. Yes. Yes. You didn't have to call the cops. You had truant officers. Yes, yes. Okay. You had adults. That last resort was the police. Mm -hmm. Now it's the first resort. Mm -hmm. And you should always ask yourself, that young man should not, young boy should not have been cuffed in Kentucky on his elbow. Behind his back. Behind his back. Which is, which is something they do to, to, uh, subdue a, a criminal criminals. Okay, if you look at some of the cases where cops have come in and flipped young ladies yeah. on the swole. I mean, they I don't think you have to do at the desk, right? Yeah. He yeah. Like, she like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he, she, she said she pulled her lot. out of the, the desk and slammed, and slammed her on the ground. He didn't really pull her out of the desk, JJ. He took the desk to split the oh, yeah. the 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 <laughs> Now we should ask ourselves, why is this why, why are we in this situation? Things don't happen in the back end. You go back and you begin to cut. You begin to cut positions. You begin to cut important people because you cut positions. Because people have to do things that is not a job description. Okay. Education. If you don't think education is important, why do you think there's a battle going on right now? If you don't think voting is important, why do you think the battle is going on right now? Okay. Whole thing about it, what we're talking about is goes back. In 1980, because before 1980, America was doing quite well in education. Okay, and that includes public schools, the public education. Okay, so we have to understand why we are in the situation that we're in. Okay, where all these people are going to prison. Now, I'm going to share something with you that I share in my introduction to sociology class when I talk about this topic. This ties in. Um, there were some community activists that wanted me to come to the school board meeting. My kids are not in the school district, but they said, you need to come because you need to see what's being done to these children. And a lot of these children were black children. So I said, okay, I'll come. Because what they told me is that these kids are going to be replaced in cardboard boxes. And I'm saying, cardboard boxes? What are you talking about? They said, you know the boxes that the refrigerator comes in? They cut a hole out and they put a chair in the box. And when a kid gets unruly, they're able to sit in the box. Now I want you to think about this to a seven, eight year old. I want you to think about this to a 10 year old. You sit in the corner in the box looking at the rest of his classmates. Thank you. Already preparation. This is what Michelle Alexander talks about in New Jim Crow. You got the coal, you got the chair in the, in the corner. This is what we're dealing with, folks. And they're justifying, the school board members are justifying why they do this. Hold on, Cheyenne. In fact, one school district in this city is doing this practice right now. Who is this? <laughs> Go ahead. My it's not, it's not a, in, in East Valley. Go ahead. My dad started working with um, a school on Gila River Reservation with their like, Down syndrome kids and they're trying to come up with a, some type of curriculum for them. And their principal calls the 
special needs room, like the trauma room. Wow. Say that again. The principal calls the special needs room, classroom, the trauma room. Wow. Well, there was this thing on Facebook, like, I don't know when, but I think it was like a couple weeks ago. And it was like this, no, it wasn't, it was very recent. It was this white teacher in like a pilgrim costume with oh, these other two uh, white kids and they had the little black girl with the rope around her neck sitting down for their reenactment, the yeah. reenactment of like the civil rights, whatever. Civil wars. Yeah. yeah. And they had, she had like two like white children next to her yeah. like holding the, the yeah. chains or whatever with the, okay. And the girl was smiling. Well, you're See, what we have to do is, you think about that. You think about individuals who are in front of children. I asked Ms. Caldwell, hope, Miles, you have something? No. Okay, I asked Ms. Caldwell about doctors. If, if, if a doctor is prejudiced, can he provide quality treatment? No. But if, a, sorry. If, an, if an educator teaches prejudice, can they provide quality learning? No. Mm -hmm. Excuse me? If you're prejudiced. But it, also, but it also goes back to the that Stop, saying, JJ. Stop, JJ. What did you say, Mr. Williams? That's if you bring it on, bring it into your workspace, like you said, not all races are the are out there with the uh, robes, and you said, you know, they wear those ties, mm -hmm. uh, all that. They're wearing their ties because they have the same mindset, they just change their views. Yeah, yeah, and you can still give up, like, if you're prejudiced, you still educate people. Really? Or you oh. Really? Hold up! Because they didn't defend themselves. They didn't defend themselves. You're not, like... Be clear, be clear. Okay. You don't want to find I know. <laughs> 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 no, I'm saying that, like, if I'm, if I'm saying that, and there's like, let's say, like this group, like this group, and you just want to get your point across. And if there's white people in the class, you want to teach them the same information as you're teaching everyone else. It's at the creek. He's trying to say keep the prejudice aside, like don't even mix it. Like, it's gonna come out. You can still do what you're gonna do. It is. It is. It is. You know, it's gonna come out, uh, Mr. Williams. Great. You know what's going to come out? When you have issues, Where? like you can't make it to class because something came up. When it's come, you know how it's going to come out? When you're having conversations with that individual and they talk down to you and don't respect you because you're a male or because you're a woman or because you're black or because you're Mr. Williams. And you know, I mean, you can... And you know, and you like Miss Horn said, heart. you can tell when somebody. No, you can't. Sometimes they're busy. Oh, yeah. Oh, hey, that's I, great. Some people that. I, I like it when I grew up. up. Hold on, folks. When I grew up, you, learn, like, you guys, because I'm old. I'm not so proud of nobody else. But in fifth grade, a young white boy <laughs> did not like me at all. He called me nigger every single day for nine months. We went on to the sixth grade. And he tried to do it when we got to sixth grade, but by then I was big enough to kick his you know what. <laughs> but the funny thing about it is that as an adult and being on Facebook, this person comes back into my life and wants to be my friend. Prejudices all get out all this time. So why do you want to be my friend now that you're adult? Did you, 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 you have an epiphany? Well, maybe he did, though. Maybe his parents talked to him. Maybe his parents talked Yeah, exactly. So maybe That's he got older and he realized his parents, like, beliefs weren't his beliefs. Maybe Ra yeah, time. racism and hatred yeah, yeah, is taught. It's not learned. It could be different. I feel like because racism isn't, like, it's taught. It's not in your heart. It's not born. You grow up thinking, like, black people are different from them. Okay. It's hereditary. Khadija? When I was in fifth grade, my teacher, Yeah, and she'll remind me, like, oh, did you have to go, like, 
<laughs> you know, <laughs> your mind is like where in the outer class. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, hold on. Miss Alexis? So, I just had a speech that I did ethnic hair on. My professor is a white woman. And so, we needed visual aids in order to assist with our speech. They weren't supposed to take away from our speech, so they were supposed to be like limited, no words or anything. So, I just put pictures of box braids, dreads. I get my grade back, it's not what I expected, and there's a comment that my slideshow was basic. And I didn't know how to take that. Your slideshow was what? Basic. Like basic? Plain. Simple. Simple, plain, nothing was uh, there. Yeah. No substance. Wait, wait. Yes, Mom. So today I was uh, in my serial killer and mass That's murderer right. class. Yes, I have a slide. Yeah. So I was in my serial killer class, and there's this woman I'm sitting next to. She's an older white woman, probably 40-something. And she goes, hey, Mona, um, I really like your hair. And I said, thank you. And she was like, um, how long? She was like, how long is it? And I was like, well, you know, if I straighten it, it can go, you know, down to my shoulder. She was like, well, do you ever straighten it? And I was like, well, I haven't straightened it in like two years. And she was like, it's so crazy because my friend whose baby is part black, um, she straightens her baby's hair all the time and it's just so beautiful. Her hair is just so beautiful when it's straight. And I was like, okay. And then she was like, you know what, you should straighten your hair. She was like, it's so crazy how white girls want mixed hair and black girls want straight hair. I, 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 I was like, um, you didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to say. First of all, I don't care to have straight hair. I like my hair curly. Second of all, she was just completely ignorant. Not all black women want straight hair. So I don't know what she thought of saying that to me was going, what that was going to, I'm the only black girl in that class. No, that just made me mad all over again. Like, she really made me mad. I had no idea what to say to her. Like, I didn't okay. know. This is what happened. Like okay, Mr. Ronald has something to say. Let Mr. Ronald have his piece. Uh, listen up. <laughs> yes. Listen up. Yes. I'm, I'm 83 years old. And I'm from North New Jersey. For 1934. So it was, it was half white and half black. Now, we never had problems like today. This is the worst I've ever seen. I've never it's seen like it as black bad black. as today. You would think it would be better. Uh-uh. It's just it's getting, getting worse. That's a fact from coming from me. And would you say that's due to the uh, to part, part of the presidency? Putting, um, I don't know. I, I have. I don't have the answer. Okay. okay. I don't. <laughs> I don't want to do is. I don't have the answer. I do. Would you say it's? Uh, I do. Because <laughs> you're going to be on your final. Yes, ma'am. Okay. She's on the side. Okay. That's the lady. Okay. She's oh. <laughs> I just want y'all to be aware that's <laughs> the question. Mr. Williams? Okay. <laughs> Folks, the question, as Mr. Ronald said, that he says it, it's getting worse, and I've heard that many times. If we go back to Dr. Du Bois, human rights leader, um, sociologist, contemporary sociologist, educator, scholar, and what's interesting is the day he died was um, August 27th, the day before the March on Washington. And the, the debates that he had with Booker T. Washington, he believed that black people should use this here. Booker T. was about using our hands, okay, working with the hands. But they had the same philosophy about improving the black race, okay? And, and I think I have it on the next slide. 
the problem of, Amer of the 20th century is the color line, according to the boys. What's the problem of the 21st century? The color line. We're still dealing with the same thing. And what's interesting is, um, Mr. Ronald could kind of add on your argument, your theories, that Mr. Williams was asking. You got social media, that laptop. See, we got a lot of um, ugly people that are behind the scenes typing. But as soon as they get in front of me, outside that screen, they, they, they don't know what they're talking about. No. no. So that's something that we have to understand, the ugliness that is taking shape. All right. So the whole thing is black people should use their minds. The problem of the 20th century is the 21st century. It's the same problem that he asked what was going on, what's going to bring the problem in the coming into the 1900s to the 20th century. So we're talking about um, his study, the Philadelphia Negro was done in 1898, looking at segregation. This was pre-civil rights movement. We're talking about the late 1800s. He was in his late 30s, in his early 30s, excuse me. To study this um, area, the Fifth War, Fifth and Sixth Wars of Philadelphia, look at the segregation patterns. And that was due to the new Jim Crow laws after Reconstruction. People will tell you that Barack Obama was the first black guy to graduate from Harvard. This guy graduated from Harvard in the 1800s. But see, when we don't know our history, we just regurgitate what somebody else is telling us. You will always hear me use the statement, research it yourself. I have you fact check me while we're in class. It's about a line, folks. This is what we're dealing with. Okay. His disputes with Booker T. Washington are well known, but there was another person he had disputes with that we're going to deal with, we might deal with it today. Um, he doesn't know who the other person he had dispute with. Uh, uh, Marcus Garvey. And his disputes, see, with Booker T. Washington, his disputes with disagreements with Washington were philosophical differences, but they understood and respected each other. His disputes with Garvey were, were antagonistic. They were ugly, I mean nasty very, very name calling. You know, two men of that stature. Didn't they say, I don't know if it's true, but didn't they say he was a setup for, uh, for Mark, Marcus Garvey? We'll get to that later. Okay. <laughs> we'll get to that later. Not today. Okay. We're going to just deal with him as old. Um, he was labeled a communist. Okay. So the talent of intent, what you know, notice, learn, misunderstand it, you're going to see it again. The talent of intent, 10% 10 of black people will be uh, lead the race. Okay, it offers several books of man of many quotes. Okay, the problem of the 20th century is the color line. Okay, the problem of the 20th century is the color line. To be poor, a poor man is hard, however, to be a poor race in a land of dollars is the bottom of hardships. Okay. The power of the ballot we need in um, sheer self-defense, else what, uh, else what save us from a um, second slavery. So voting is important. People will tell you that voting is not important. And the boys understood that. And they said, well, I only, my vote is only, I'm only one person. What can I do? Do you know that there are people who were only one person change the world? Only one person. And when you have that self-defeatist mentality, my question is this. Why are you here? Why are you here? If those individuals felt that way, they wouldn't have did the things they did to sacrifice their lives. Sacrifice a whole lot, folks. So this is what we're talking about, folks. If voting is not important, why are all these provisions put in place to prevent people from voting? If education is not important, why are all these things being done to prevent people? See, the conversation we have in this room, the conversations that need to be had. When you don't have debate, you don't have dialogue, how are you going to change? 
You can't, unless the discussion starts. And what you'll find out is the people that you have differences with in reference to biological makeup, y'all catching the same hair. And the boys understood this. Understood. Now, of course he had differences, like I said, with the two people um, I mentioned, but there was another person who had differences with him, and that was Carter D. Woodson. He wrote about it in his book, Miseducation of the Negro. He talked about the leaders at the time, but see, when you read this book, and from, I'm trying to remember, that, no, he did state, he just said black leaders. And because I knew who he was talking about at the time, he was studying history, he was one of the people who was talking about the disagreements that he had with supporting President Woodrow Wilson, who never stopped mentions, and put laws in place to prevent black people from improving the quality of their life economically. But that's something that we have to understand. And this is what I was talking about. Just keep your hands great. I was talking about, think about this, folks. The seventh, the seventh war, 1897. We're talking about 120 years ago. Okay, the kind of uh, race, race and racism impacted the lives of black people. We're talking about in the 1800s. The Civil War was supposed to change the issue of race. It did. They thought the Civil Rights Movement was supposed to issue, change the issue of race. It did. You got these people who are considering themselves leaders, supposed to have the best interest of people to deal with the issue of race. Until you deal with the structure of this country, you're not going to change the issue of race. Case in point. In structure, I don't care what it is, but I use the example. And I think I used you, Stewie, and I said the whole thing because you own an NFL team. The first thing um, somebody said, well, she has to know the knowledge about football. No, she don't. No, she doesn't. She can own, have a bunch of money, but she still won't be an owner of a team. She can have more money than 10 owners combined. She can't be an owner because of the way the structure is set up. JJ, it's my time. She can own, have that much money. She still can't own a team. Because if they don't want a woman owning, it's not going to happen. Mr. Williams, you could own a team. It won't happen. Because if they don't want your biological makeup, it ain't happening. Is it that way with the whole golfing thing? With the whole uh, sport club, the gym club? Basically, yes. Yeah. If the structure is set up that way and they vote, then it's not going to happen. Because based on the vote, and that's how the structure is. So when we was looking at the Philadelphia Negro, and you begin to really go in depth with what he was researching, you begin to realize, hey, wait a minute, this looks familiar. Yes, it does. Because he was dealing with segregation. He was dealing with racism. He was dealing with the whole issue of race. And this is before pre-1950s and 60s. That's what we're talking about, folks. And the boys was doing it in his day. We have to deal with this problem. We have to. If we don't, we will um, shortchange ourselves. Oh, that's just cool. So let me let me deal with this. Um, dialogue about race. The question we have to ask ourselves is why? Why can't we have a quality dialogue? Why? Why can't we do it? This is something I want you to marinate on. Or something I want you to marinate on. And have a quality dialogue. Why? Because these problems are not going to stop. But we have to first of all deal with it. And there's a way we can deal with it. We begin to talk about it. And what we have to do is when we talk about it, we have to bring people to the meeting or to the table that not that aren't afraid of getting their feelings hurt. That's the most important thing. You can't be afraid to get your feelings hurt. 
That's how we move forward. But we have to have the will. Dr. King said in March, March 31st, 1968, his speech he never talked about is the American people have the will to deal with these issues. And I ask that in other classes, that we as American people have the will. But this, this, this thing is, I know it's a, on a global scale. I understand that. I'll be the first one to tell you. But we have to sit down and have, have an honest conversation. And when you have that conversation, like Dr. Boys was trying to, what you going to do with your cell phones? Put them down. Do you have the will to put your cell phones down? Yeah. To have this quality? Oh, no, you don't. <laughs> no, you don't. You don't have the will because you, you, you're you afraid. Put your cell phones down. Let's have a quality conversation about this. Yeah, I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to take my picture even this whole But you, but you, but you, we gotta have a conversation. We do.